This is Good Shepherd Sunday, right? It's always the fourth Sunday of Easter is always Good Shepherd Sunday. We always have a gospel reading from John chapter 10. This year, it happens to be the first 10 verses, which gives us I am the gate in Jesus's day when they would pen sheep out in the out in the pasture out in when they had them out grazing, they would find spots or they had pre-made spots that had three walls and one opening. There was no gate. There was no physical gate. The shepherd was the gate. The shepherd laid down in the gate. And then multiple people, like when I said I had sheep and Kurt and Bill had sheep, we would take turns, right? And when the gatekeeper needed to be, when the gate needed to be open, if I needed to get my sheep out and and Kurt was now the gate, I would ask Kurt to move so I could go in and get my sheep. And I would walk in and call my sheep and my sheep would follow me and the rest of the sheep would stay there. Do you believe that? I've never actually seen it done, but I've read it several places and I believe it. So it it sounds a little far-fetched to me, actually. But the sheep knew the voice of their shepherd. The sheep knew their shepherd so well and intimately. That's the other thing you got to look at this. This is an intimate relationship. Not only does the sheep know the shepherd, but the shepherd knows the sheep. Right? And that's where we get Psalm 23. And Psalm 23, everybody knows it, right? I could just start it again and you could just do it without looking at your... Should we try this? Don't look. No cheating. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not. Stores my soul. His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valleys that I shall fear no evil. For you. you pre- you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So we don't know it as well as we should. So here's the thing with this psalm, though. Where do we hear this psalm read? Funerals. Why? The last line. The last line is, is, is good. What would you say if I told you the last line is a bad translation? <laughs> it's a very interesting psalm. And David, being a shepherd, knows all about sheep. And he writes this psalm about how he is a sheep. And God is his shepherd. Right? The Lord is my shepherd. What gives God the right to be our shepherd? Or what gives us the right to be God's sheep? I read an interesting quote from a book that I read a long time ago, but I reread parts of it just this past week to prepare for this. It's called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. It's written by a man named Philip Keller who grew up in South, in, in Africa. And he was a shepherd and then became a lay minister in a congregation. So he has an understanding of Psalm 23 that those of us who haven't been around sheep don't have. But he wrote a book. It's a hundred and almost 50 page book on six verses. There's a lot more to this psalm than we understand. But he said in the very first part of this where he's talking about the Lord is my shepherd, I quote, I recall that the planet Earth, which is my temporary home for a few short years, is so minute a speck of matter in space that if it were possible to transport our most powerful telescope to our nearest neighbor star, Alpha Centauri, and look back this way, the Earth could not be seen even with the aid of that powerful instrument. All of this is a bit humbling and it drains the ego from a man and puts things in proper perspective. It makes me see myself as a mere might of material in an enormous universe. Yet the staggering fact remains that Christ, the creator of such an enormous universe of overwhelming magnitude, dines to call himself my shepherd and invites me to consider myself his sheep, his special object of affection and attention. And who better could care for me? 
right? Remember, this book was written in 1970, so some of his scientific facts might be a little off. But if we transported the most powerful telescope we had to the nearest star and tried to look back at Earth, you couldn't even see Earth. The universe is an overwhelming, huge expanse of space. And God created it all. And in the midst of all of that, God created you. And He wants you to be His sheep. He wants you to be one of His most prized possessions. And just like I said earlier, when the shepherd goes into that fold and calls those sheep, the sheep know His name and the shepherd knows His sheep can tell by looking at them whether or not they're agitated. You can tell by looking at them if they have any kind of abnormalities. You can tell by looking at them if they have anything wrong with them at all. Right? David said, I want to be God's sheep because I know in that that I will never want for anything. I'll never have need for anything that I absolutely have to have. Right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. What do you hear in that makes me? I just gave it to you. Right? Have you ever been have you ever had to do something you didn't want to do and somebody made you do it? I, all the kids are going like this right now. <laughs> But adults, you know what I'm talking about, right? Something you've had to do, you didn't want to do it, and somebody had to make you do it. Now, most of us would not be upset or fight against the fact if somebody told us to go lay down. Right? Most adults fight with toddlers, right? To go take a nap, and most of us would gladly trade places with them. Right? Okay, you go do the dishes, and I'll go take a nap. All right? But here it says, the Lord makes me lie down. A shepherd actually has to make a sheep lay down. It has to have four things. A sheep needs four things before it is able to lay down. Four things. If it has any fear at all, a sheep will not be still and rest. It will not lay down. It will be up and ready to run if it has any kind of fear or agitation in it. It has to be completely free from fear. Sheep are very social animals. They have to be free from any friction within their social group. Meaning that the mother or the the big sheep will guard her spot of grazing and will butt heads with any sheep that tries to come into her spot. And if she sees another sheep there, she will actually ram it to get it out of her spot. But the shepherd can clear all of this agitation. But if they have any of that agitation at all, they won't lay down. They'll be up and ready to run and butt or run and defend what they need to defend for themselves. If they're tormented by flies or parasites, they will not lie down. Only if they're free from pests will they lie down. And the fourth one is they have to know that they are completely satisfied food-wise. They can't be in a need for finding food or otherwise they'll lay down. That's why... It specifically says, He'll make me lie down in green pastures. These sheep are without fear. They have no agitation with anyone else in their group. They do not have any kind of flies or parasites or pests agitating them. And they have been fed enough that they're willing to sit down in the greatest of banquets that they could ever feast upon. That's what the Lord does for us. Bless you. He makes us lie down. Because He calms our fears. Clears our agitation. Takes away all of our pests. And He feeds us and gives us everything we need. And then do we get to lay there forever? Are you awake? Do we get to lay there forever? I see time.
Todd going like this. And Todd is correct. We don't get to lay there forever. It's a short rest, but we get to rest. Because then what's the next verse? He. You can look now. He. And then. He guides me along pat right. He guides me along long right pathway. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He lead, guides me along right pathway. He leads me along still waters. He leads me. And just like he said in the, in the Jesus said in the gospel reading, the shepherd comes into the fold and calls his sheep and he takes his sheep where? Out of the fold. We don't get to stay in the in the resting place. We don't get to stay in the pen. We don't get to be in that safe place because God's going to take us out. He's going to lead us out into the world. He's going to restore our souls. He's going to guide us along right pathways. He's going to lead us through Death Valley. Who's ready to go? You have the best guide in the world. Right? The psalm is about a journey, though. It's not about a resting place. It's not about being content. It is about being content in what we have in the shepherd, but it's about us following our shepherd and understanding that he's going to take care of our every need. Because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The, the shepherd would use the rod and the staff to help get the, the sheep out of areas that they shouldn't be in because they followed people and the other sheep in the wrong places. It'll help to keep the wolves away at bay. It helps to do so many things. The shepherd anoints my head with oil. The anointing with oil helps to keep the parasites away. I was talking to Carrie a little bit about this earlier this week. And I remember reading someplace preparing for a sermon once on this and how sheep, if they have any kind of flies, that because fly, they fly around their nose, and they'll fly up in their nose, and they'll, they'll just irritate the sheep to all get out. And the sheep will actually find a post or a wall and will beat its head against the wall to try to kill the fly. And in essence, it'll actually kill itself because it's trying to kill this fly that's irritating it so much. That's why the anoints his head with oil. It keeps the parasites and the bugs away. Jesus is there to do so much for us. Right? But there's a couple things in here that are that, that we need to really look at. Paths of righteousness. He guides us along paths of righteousness. The word in the in Psalm 23 that's that is translated as path is not translated anywhere else in all of the Hebrew Bible as paths. It's more translated as tracks or entrenchments or even ruts. It's talking about like ox carts, right? When a cart goes through mud and it makes trenches in the ground, right? You've all, you know what I'm talking about, right? Ruts. You can do it with a with a jeep or a four wheeler out in deep mud and make deep crevices in the in the ground, right? That's what this is. It's not a path. It's a rut. So this path of righteousness is more like a groove in the ground. So when we, that's the sermon title, by the way, if you guys didn't catch that. When we walk with God and we follow after God, he's going to put us into a groove. And when we find that righteous groove that we can follow after God, we'll be stuck there, right? Because God could make a pretty deep groove if he wanted to. But he's going to put us there. And help us to follow after him. We find that groove and just completely follow. And then God gives us a meal in the presence of our enemies. And then verse 6, right? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. How could you make that any better? Because goodness and mercy are going to follow me. Right? Who doesn't want goodness and mercy to, to follow behind you everywhere you go? And who doesn't want to dwell in the house of God forever? But here's the thing that's interesting about this. It makes it more about a destination than a journey. Right? Verses 3 through 4. 2, 3, and 4 are about the journey. Right? He leads me beside still water. He guides me along paths. He guides me in my righteous groove. He leads me through Death Valley. And then we get to the destination. 
But, but it's all about this journey that we're on with God. So I don't think a destination is the right place. And some of those words there are not necessarily good, goodly translated. Goodly? That's my new word for the morning. Goodly. Surely goodness and mercy. Surely is a good word, right? What if I told you it was wrong? And that a more proper meaning for the word surely would be only. Only goodness and mercy will follow me. And what if I told you that the word follow is not a good, good translation of the word there? It is kind of a follow, but it's a follow with an intent to catch, which would be more of a... Like if I'm running after somebody and I'm trying to catch them, what would that be? What? Capture? No. You haven't captured them yet. You're chasing them, pursuing. Only goodness and mercy will pursue me all of my life. I just got goosebumps from that. Verse 5 says that God creates a table, a banquet for us in the presence of our enemies. Meaning that our enemies are all around us. And God is giving us, giving us a lavish feast. Right? In the shepherd sense, it's, I've got this great green grass, so I'm going to let my sheep eat here. And I know the wolves are right here. But I don't care because I'm ready to take care of them. And my sheep are going to get to eat. And that's what God said. That's what He does for you. And then he says, and only my goodness and mercy are going to follow, pursue you, chase after you all of your life. Your enemies are still here, but don't worry about them because I've already taken care of them. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word dwell there is more meaning to turn or return, which is why some scholars translated that, that I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever because dwelling in the house of the Lord is something that all of us want to do, right? It's a good thing. But maybe if we understood it in the sense of the journey, it takes on a little bit different meaning. Only goodness and mercy will pursue me all of my life and I will return to the presence of God always. It's always about being on a journey and it's always about being with our shepherd. It's always about knowing how much God loves us and listening to and understanding what his voice is and where he's calling us and leading us to go. It's all about following after God, being in our righteous groove, walking behind him, knowing that he has our best intentions in mind and that he can do the best for us. So remember... If God is your shepherd, only goodness and mercy are going to follow after you, pursue you all of your life. And you can constantly return to that shepherd, knowing that he will give you what you need and tend to your desires and tend to your wants and lead you to the places that only he can to give you the life that only he can give you.